All right. The web gremlins are doing their thing. We're putting all the pieces together to go live on YouTube. <clears throat> For those that are here live, this will be the second time that we've attempted this. For those that are joining us, it looks like I see us on YouTube now. Those joining us on YouTube, welcome. We're glad you're here. We've got the one, the only Chris Burgess with us. We also have Stock Landers in the house. I'm going to mute you guys so I don't keep hearing double talk in my ear. And you're entering at an interesting time here. We're in the second hour of our group coaching. I'm desperately trying to find my Zoom controls where I can share my screen again. There you go. In the first hour of group coaching here at TSU, we had a little bit of a um, analysis brawl breakout here, and we've got the we've got three estimates of where the market could find a bit of relief from this free fall that it's in having dropped now over 11% in six trading days. Here's my, my estimate using Fibonacci analysis. Then Scott um, came over to the top and very audaciously said that there's going to be a zero point pivot right at exactly 363. And he bet his and 29 cents and 29. Is that what it was? Three, three 28, 29 cents. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. Hold on. I want to, I just want to make sure we have, uh, all of the, uh, that's covered three, six, three and, and 28 cents. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, if you hit 29, we'll still give it to you, Scott. So that's Scott's. And then we were just getting ready. We were starting to talk about, um, Chris's target as well. And uh, it's it's a no holds barred. Um, what do they call it? Uh, brawl <laughs> going on here. I want to make sure we're crystal clear. Nobody that's in the room is suggesting that we are going to be entering a bullish phase. In fact, let me just do this as well. If you look on a weekly chart, it's it's actually amazing how textbook this head and shoulders pattern is with a neckline, a testing of the neckline, and now a breaking down after the testing of the neckline. If you were writing a technical analysis book for stock trading, you should take a screenshot of that and put it in there because it is the most beautiful head and shoulders pattern you're ever going to see, which is a bearish signal. Does that mean it can't break down? Of course not. All, all patterns can break down. It's all a discipline in um, managing probabilities. But if uh, I was a betting man which apparently we are with our zones here. Uh, I believe that we're going to pull back up a little bit towards maybe within this red box and then probably continue our march onward and downward. So with that said, Chris is about to take over here and offer his insights on where we may find some relief from the free fall. Yeah, as I was um, hedging a little bit earlier, my just what I've been looking at is not nearly as cool and advanced as Josh's or Scott's, but my, my caveman approach to this is just um, looking at the world's simplest tools that every trader uses, which is the moving averages, and just noticing how the market has behaved in the past and where we might be headed now. So this is a weekly chart of the S&P 500 like we were just looking at. So this horizontal red line here, this is the bear market level, right? So we are officially in a bear market now, as you guys know, since uh, Monday. So just zooming out a little bit, just kind of noticing how the market behaves. Typically, you know, when we're in a bull market, when things are going up, it tends to pull back to the 50 period moving average here when we're going up. That tends to be where we find our support, um, except for here where we got nowhere near it on the pullbacks and we're pulling back to like the eight moving average, basically just writing that up the whole time. But um, when we get more sustained pullbacks, it tends to come right back to the 200 period moving average. So I was just looking at this earlier here. And when we go back to 08, because um, we were talking about, you know, the head and shoulders on 08 and then breaking down and all of that. And you can see, obviously, did not stop at the, the 200 moving average. So if we do break through that, I think definitely it's a lot lower. But you can see there was quite a bit of, um, what does Scott call it? Like friction around there, right? Quite a bit of uh, a sticking point where we came down here, we tested it, we tested again, how to bounce, and then we finally broke through and then kind of retested it to the upside before falling back down again. So I was just looking at that and noticing, um, you know, how often we kind of pull back to the 200 here. And so I'm thinking if we do keep going down, we might be getting closer to 3,500. Just that that's where the, the 200 is. 
at the moment. So I wouldn't be surprised if we have just a little bit of like friction around this. We get another couple of weeks to the downside. So what that's my that's my if you would, analysis. So here. we can we can really drill down what the wager is. We have to decide what this wager is going to be. We could bet each other's trading accounts because candidly, <laughs> whoever wins probably should be managing the trading accounts, right? I think I have the least to lose in this wager, so I'm in. <laughs> well, were you going to pull it up on SPY? Or I can pull it up on SPY here. We'll get the 200. Uh, it's the same thing. So 350 on SPY. 350. Which I think yep, yours was so like exactly. 350.9 or something like that. Let's do this. Wait a minute. Oh, were you on a weekly? What was that chart? Yeah, I was on a weekly, but doesn't gotcha. Make it I was like that does not line up. Okay, yeah. yep, perfect. Three forty nine and change. So we're gonna be accurate. There you go. And in all fairness, so Chris is a moving target. We'll put two hundred SMA because it may go up a little bit as uh, as days progress here. So it's possible we've now created a scenario where two of us could be correct because I could see a deal where we actually bounce a little bit here, come on up as the 200 progresses on up, bounce, find a little support, and then head on down. That could happen. So could turn out that uh, Chris and I split Scott's trading account, which I'd be okay with. <laughs> awesome. Hey, before I forget, how many do we have here? Maybe I should wait a minute and let some more people join in live. Looks like we got four here live right now. Um, immediately after today's group coaching session, the live on YouTube, Scott's going to be hosting an open Q&A for Trader Traction. This is enrollment season now. We're going to be going into the next quarter of Trader Traction. Uh, some of you guys saw a little bit about that in the recession proof series that we just wrapped up. But if you've been wondering about Trader Traction, if Trader Traction's for you, when is now the right time to sign up for Trader Traction, then uh, keep an eye on email. I suppose if you're just on YouTube, um, I'll find the link here when, when somebody else is talking and I'll, I'll put it in the YouTube chat <coughs> so we can get you there. And um, it's, uh, it's actually a, a Zoom meeting. So you can turn your microphone on, ask questions, connect with Scott. And, um, and for some of you who are already Traction students, if you wanna find out more about Traction Pro, that would be a great place to ask those questions as well. All right, let's pivot here. Scott, I'm going to toss the ball back to you. And um, I, I would love to understand a little bit more. And I know you, it's, some of this may be duplicate from what we talked about in, in the first hour here. But just these market, these bearish markets are so volatile and they're so infrequent in fact, that's where we just spent the last three days talking about the changes between bull market analysis and bear market analysis and as you're working with the funds like what's y'all's battle plan for how to how to take advantage of the fall but not get cut by the falling knife so to speak as the colloquialism stands so let me i'm gonna come this different a couple different ways to give people perspective. So the reason I, I want to use this, and this is what we looked at actually this time last week was right before this fall happened, right? And we've had a really significant move down and we can kind of see that, right? So depending on who I'm working with and depending on their time horizon really does have an impact on how to take advantage of this <clears throat> and depending on how they're positioned clearly, right? How much cash they raise coming into the we'll call it this most recent peak and where we are now I with funds who have much longer term horizons some of them have 5 10 20 horizons i have people who are more active like a lot of people they're listening to us on youtube or in um, group coaching right now that are more day to multi-day swing positions so it all depends on who i'm dealing with and to what their mandate their charter is if you will so some i have are more set up to they've raised cash 55 65 70 percent cash going into the end of last year so they're quite happy and so now they're hedged on the short side if you will 
and maintaining those positions and they're just managing it. And I tend to, the best way I can explain this is as the market has a very, a, what I call a sizable wave down, they will start to, if they feel like it's first wave, they really want to get to the second wave. But they get the second wave, depending on how they're positioned, they will start to unwind some of that hedge. And if they have positions longer term that they're really interested in, they may be going to a valuation model of looking at what they think, call it fair value at that point in time that they're looking to take advantage of. So it ended in their horizon and where they think the economy is going to be in the next 36 to 48 months. I know it seems like a long cry from where we are right now, guys. I, I get that. But I want to give you guys context. Everybody I'm dealing with is not just actively trading like so many of us are. Then I have traders who are much more active or funds are much more active in the market. And what they're looking for is what I call a complete cycle. For instance, if they shorted what we covered last week this time, coming through here, and we'll just assume the obvious, okay, it went short. They have a certain amount of movement they expect from that move. They're unwinding that, that position as it goes into their targeting, and then they're going to manage to trade after that. If they don't want to be in front of the volatility of the Fed, and this is different for the people I work with, then they're completely out. They've maximized this move, which is a very good move in a short duration time. It's an extreme move. They've unwound that position, and they're out before the Fed. That one's to do with the volatility of the Fed. Then they will reset the pending, recalibrate, reframe their charts for where the next leg is. They will also do what a lot of pros I tell you will do, and I know this from doing it for so long. You have core positions you have, and then you trade around those positions. A lot of traders will come in and just start trading around certain setups, just smaller. We talk about this all the time. 1R, base hits, small stuff like that while they're waiting for this next major leg to set up again. They're managing the current leg. But they're also, as they're unwinding that short term, I'll call it what I call it, what I coined in 2003 is they call a mini swing, 2004. It's a mini swing. It's a multi-hour to multi-day trend. And that's it. And 2022 has been the year of what I call mini swings, the content that I teach for years and years and years. But these are multi-hour to multi-day trends. And that's the environment we're in right now for most people who are more active because you don't just keep buying the dip. It's not working, right? But mm -hmm. you can still do that in choppy markets. And I hate to say the word stagflation, but if you bring up stagflation and people, oh, it means we're gonna go nowhere for years. Well, okay, that's great news. Wait, Scott, you've lost your mind. No, if we get stuck in a range and a channel like this back and forth, and you know, well, basically this is resistance and this is support and the market has to consolidate for a long time, you short the highs, you buy the lows, or you cover the lows and then get long. You just do this. And a lot of you will make a lot more money in that than a trending market, believe it or not, if you're willing to adapt your mindset. And the world we live in now, it's hard for me sometimes just seeing who I've worked with, people I follow and study and over the years. I hate to call the markets a casino effect. I really do. But it's almost like they're going to force the markets to keep having volatility movement so people can make their money. And I'm talking like major players, like we've got to make the markets move. And that's the only thing I personally battle with. And I won't know if that's the way it's playing out. So we all go through this. We're all in this together, guys, uh, for what's worth. But that, I hope that gives you guys some context because of who I deal with. Different players, different mindsets, they're not all doing the exact same thing. Does that help? That, but that last thing on this, mm -hmm. you get on the interstate, there's 18 wheelers. Are they going 90 miles an hour? Probably not. Okay. They're in the right-hand lane. Then you got Josh and this brand new Maserati going hundred miles yeah. an hour in the left lane. There we go. Right. So different people, different speeds, left lane drivers that shouldn't be, that make people mad. Same thing in the market. You have whales and you have minnows. The question is, where are you on the fish spectrum? Like, are you a whale or are you a minnow? Are you, you know, micro amoeba in the water, <laughs> plankton, <laughs> like that? That So that depends on the speed at which things move. You like my analogy, Josh, but it really does. And once you see that, guys, you stop thinking everybody's trying to trade like you are. You trade your way. The market's plenty big for all of us. It's got the whales, the great whites. And then you've got the micro, you know, microbes or whatever that are out there, the plankton or whatever it is. We're we're basically, I guess, plankton. You know, something like that. Oh my so, gosh. You like that? I have, 
I've been looking for, I'm kind of jealous of the whole turtle traders thing. I'm like, that's so clever. Like it created this movement around turtle trading. And I'm like, we need a movement at trade smart. What could we be? And I've been just racking my brain trying to figure out like, what's our version of the turtle traders. And so I'm going to, I'm going to work with, um, I don't think amoeba. That's this exactly give the, the right traders. impression. The trout traders. <laughs> the Mark Fisher, five fishermen, right? <laughs> Fisher, Fisher traders. <laughs> Fisher of men. Yeah. Oh man. Um, I had a question, and then I got derailed with amoebas. So, so go ahead. Um, I don't. <laughs> um, I do want to bring. A moment of context monthly chart long term just the bottom side of this right here right here just around that 359 70 that's one of the levels i think it's early 59 60 something like that we're looking at that's a little spot we might find some support it lines with other things i'm looking at but everybody's watched super bowl i'm sure halftime show right guys we're getting back to halftime the midpoint of this massive move this channel is really simple to construct. I teach a whole course on this, but it's really simple. But you can see we're starting to get back in this zone and we can play around with it. Unless they're going to truly crash the market. And I, respectfully for all of you who have portfolios that, you know, that might be underwater. What I want you to take away is even if the market did collapse. Let's just say for some reason we're down to here. Everybody flushes out. Oh my gosh, it's going to keep going. No, it's not. It's going to get buyers at some point. The valuation, if Apple comes in, let's just say 50 points in the next week, would you guys consider that fair? Would you think well, Apple's not going out of business? Would you mm. want to buy it? Now, get away from the trading side and you think about a money manager who has a long term horizon and new inflows coming in July. Does he think Apple will be higher by the end of the year or not? If it was 50 points lower, you know what Apple's price is right now, assume it's 50 points lower. Does he think going into the end of this holiday year, it might be bad, but is it really this bad? And they have valuation models. Well, we need them to have that because, well, these are the people who have to deploy the cash so that they do bid these things up so we can ride with it. That's the difference between more of a, an investor man, managed portfolio mindset than trading side, more of a fundamental side, which is more on Chris's side of this thing. That's why I give you context so you kind of blend the best of both worlds and you don't just let the price action freak you out right now. I hope that's helpful. Just perspective, because a lot of people are really freaked out lately about the market's decline. I get it. But take a deep breath, step back and look at where things are, get some context. We're coming to halftime. We're about midways down of this move, so to speak, on channel on a slope. Buyers will show up at some point when they're done selling, the buyers will come in or the sellers just stop selling and we go sideways and then the sellers come in again. Oh, we can't handle this. They take it down another notch. It's an elevator rod up and down. That's all we're doing till we get to support. We don't have support. This is an interesting way of looking at it as I was checking out your chart. Um, so Chris Burgess just gave me this insight. We all can learn new things if we're just humble, you know, nobody has a corner on all the knowledge around here. And actually, I think we were alive when, when Chris pointed this out to me, because I was looking at your chart, Scott, um, which this is that this is your um, monthly chart sure. on SPY. What's that? You need to show yours. Oh, I thought it was. Stand by. <laughs> Make sure. I didn't click the actual share button. We all need to share more in life. So this is monthly spy. And as Scott was talking, I was looking at this. Josh, we can't see your charts right now. We're just Seriously? seeing your YouTube tab. Oh. Not hey, there we go. Chart? Yep. All right. Uh, for the third time, but perfect time. <clears throat> I was looking at that thinking, geez, like look at that compared to back here, which is dollars. But Chris introduced me to log charts. Like this, Chris, see, I learned from you. And this was interesting to me. Actually, this is going to bring up here. I measured the 2000 crash roughly there. And then I thought, what how that compares to the 
2007 crash pretty darn close you know plus or minus a little bit and then i thought how's that compared to current events and look where it brings us right back to y'all and we were just talking about this in hour one right this is the covid bottom right here i'm not quite confident enough to call my shot and say that we're heading to the covid bottom but i think there could be a lot of signs that suggest this right here spy to whatever that is 230 i mean if i was scott i'd be like probably 230 and 75 and a half cents if if we were just being general um but there's going to be ebbs and flows on the way on down there. But I'm just telling you the way this framework is shaping up this smooth turnover, the head and shoulders patterns, the, the disciplined downward move. And this may not seem disciplined, you know, 10%, 11% in the last six days, but it's, it's very accurately um, pivoting between, um, between Fibonacci ratios back and forth. We've been watching this thing the whole way down. In fact, if you guys were here, was it last week? Scott live streamed this. I think we were actually live on YouTube. I'm pretty yes. sure it was live on YouTube. Um, so y'all can go back and watch that video from last week. Like we're talking about here, and Scott saying, if we if we break this box, you know, here's here his purple box. This was his. You know, there's the halfway mark. He said, I think we we're gonna go about halfway through that box. Where'd we go? Halfway through that box. Then where'd we go? We continued on down. Of course, um, three weeks prior, right here. We're talking about this orange. You can't quite see it. Let me clean up. My charts are starting to look like yours, Scott. I can't see anything underneath. I'm infecting you. <laughs> Scott talks about naked charting, and I'm like, I, I, I don't <laughs> think you can call what you do. I understand. I didn't know indicators, which, you know, if you want to trade with one hand tied behind your back, go for it. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we talked about this confluence zone. If it breaks, literally, uh, I've got some very – very uh, high net worth professionals uh, that have been, you know, picking my brain about the stock market. And I gave them this line. I said, if we break this, <clears throat> I think I would be prepared for a downward move. And where did we go? Major downward move. In fact, one bro hammer was, he was wanting to buy stock uh, right here. And I was like, uh, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> I think I'd wait for them to go on sale a little bit more. So um Point being is you guys got to settle in for a longer ride on down. We'll trade it all the way on down with you. There's going to be some strategies. I would, if you missed any of the recession proof series, man, I would, um, I'd be pulling some of my risk off the table. I would be more comfortable with wider stops. And the way you're going to be more comfortable is by lowering your, your risk threshold and just be ready for a wild ride. But it's, um, it's, I think that we've got a lot more bearish pressure that's coming in. Where do you guys want to go from here? We Sometimes we have a plan. Sometimes we don't. Uh, let me see if there's any questions on YouTube. Feel free to type them in or type the questions in the, the Zoom. Sea monkeys. I like that. That's good. I don't think it's quite there yet, but. Uh, Scott's naked charts are more like the devil with the blue dress on. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> you guys. Um, what y'all got? <clears throat> Scott, what this is. So my approach, and then you can tell me kind of how your funds are looking at it. When we start experiencing a lot of volatility like this, one of the ways we can temper that, my opinion, is um look at that see they got the memo that we're bouncing off from my support zone um we can temper that a little bit by trading baskets of things in the form of an etf so trade the spy or trade sector etfs or trade um you know there, there's all there's etfs for everything and you know, what's your thought and opinion on that or do you think that there's more money to be made by trading the individual security and just dealing with the volatility I love that question, Josh. I really, I seriously, like seriously, I think for, for so many 
people out there, it makes complete and total sense to to focus on ETFs where you can because you do reduce 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 your risk of dealing with single exactly. stocks. Yes, thank you. Um, you're not dealing with single stock issues. And we've seen a lot of problems with that lately, right? With especially up to earnings stocks being clipped 20, 25%, 35%, 50%, 10% here and there. So I love ETFs. I think it allows a lot of people to sleep better at night and not have to worry about waking up to some news flash that hits the sector or some legislation that might hit or just the overall risk to the market in general. It helps diversify. Just like if you were going to trade, you know, I tell us often, if you were going to trade Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, you could take your, let's just say $5,000 and split it into three equal portions and diversify risk that way. Isn't that what an ETF really is, guys, at the end of the day? And I think it takes a lot of stress off of people. I think it allows you to get a little more bang for your buck as far as your mental self, but you also still get to participate in the upside of the downside. You may not make as much as you want from it, but you're going to sleep a little less stress. And I think it's very prudent. And I wish more traders would look at ETFs because it diversifies automatically for you. And the reality is the ETF is not going to go out of business unless the entire group did. And that's just not mm -hmm. the way they're shaped up. So yeah, I'm all, I'm all with you on that, Josh, in a heartbeat. Um, I love ETFs. I think they're a great invention. Um, and I'm thankful we have them. So I, I do like it. I also get for people who are more active, just to be clear for this, if you are a more active day trader and you're looking at specific equities and you're confident with the way you frame your charts and your trading abilities, then I think there's times where you definitely can make more. But in the current market environment, especially for people who are a little bit more positioned in it, I think ETFs are a great way to capitalize, especially if you need inverse because you're not really comfortable shorting the market. I think it's a great way to go after it that way too. So yeah, absolutely. I'm thousand percent. I'm glad you brought that up because we don't really touch on that often, do we? I didn't think about that, but that's really true. I like inverse ETFs a lot, um, especially, you know, if you guys are uncomfortable with shorting or uncomfortable with, um, you know, the size of account you would need to cover some of those shorts, you can you can get yourself in some trouble shorting stock if you don't know what you're doing. And if you've never gone through a margin call, it's not... I actually don't think I've ever had a margin call. I've, I've had students contact us that had a margin call, but I don't think I've ever actually experienced a margin call, but you, it's a bad day. You don't have a lot of options, you know, put money in now or we're closing your position. And it's quite possible, you know, if something goes parabolic, like GameStop did, uh, it's quite possible you could owe more money than actually is in your account. Like it's a bad day to lose everything that's in your account it's a really bad day to lose everything in your account plus 50% more. So hey, Josh, you know, will you, will you talk on this for a second though? A little more depth. Shorty. You, well, where I'm going with this for, for clarity for everybody in case this is something that hasn't crossed you, everybody's mind. Why do you think you need to take on that level of risk? I'm not saying Josh or me or any of you, I'm saying, can you, do you want to expand on that for a minute? Like you don't need to take on that level of risk. Is, is, is what I'm trying to, to say with what Josh is saying. Why do you want to get yourselves in that position? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I'm like, if you want to add on that, please do. Because I don't think that's always clear, everybody. Like, well, how else could I do this? Well, there's an inverse ETF. Like, you don't have to put yourself at that risk. And a lot of new traders will do that. I mean, I'm sure you've seen that with people you've known over the years, Josh. But I'm curious if you've got anything you would add to that for clarity. Yeah. So, you know, we talk about this in foundations a lot. So I just assume everybody knows it. But since we're live on YouTube and anybody can find this, let's not assume everybody knows it. And let's clear these charts. My gosh, these charts are getting ugly. I got to take a day and clean these up. I can't stand ugly charts. <clears throat> so for those that are unfamiliar with shorting, let's just go back to first base here. As the market's going down, there is a play in the rule book of stock trading that says I can borrow shares that I do not own, step one. Step two, I can sell those shares that I do not own, which brings cash into your jeans. You always put money in your jeans when you're selling stuff. Step three, market goes down. So then you buy cheaper 
than what you sold them for and return them to your broker. Okay, so you sold them for three dollar signs. You brought in two, or you brought in three dollar signs when you sold them. You had to spend two dollar signs to buy them back, and um, then you return them to the the broker. Don't ask how or why or if it's morally correct. It's okay. It really is. Um, candidly, we have to have short selling to create a liquid market. If we did not have short selling, the market would go. Um, it, it would just go parabolic, and it would be very very difficult to trade short selling plays a very important role in the u.s stock market so knowing the rules of the game you know we could do this on this is spx we could look at spy which actually could be shorted you can't short a index but you can short an etf look at that beautiful i just every time i see that that's amazing so those that are joining late scott i have a little wager so far i'm winning that wager which means he's gonna never mind uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he can give me his whole trading account, but that seems a little aggressive. Um, so we could sell right now, wherever we're at, uh, 368, and then hope this goes down and then buy it back at 360 and we're good to go. What Scott was talking about, uh, so the danger of this is, okay, say you sold, let's actually just go look at the real dangerous GameStop. So let's say you were, selling short on GameStop right <laughs> here at $16. You're like, you know what? I'm going to borrow some shares and sell them for $17 because nobody plays games anymore. They don't go to GameStop for sure. And I think it's going to go down. Well, it didn't go down. Reddit got a hold of it and it went the opposite of down. And at some point it came up to $480. So you had, you shorted this and not gone through a margin call, which you would have, but metaphorically, hypothetically speaking, let's just say it's 20 for easy math, <clears throat> $20. You'd be on the hook for $460 per share that you shorted. We'll take check or credit card. Um, it's a bad day. There's a lot of people that ended up owing more money than their entire account was worth here. And they're now in debt to the broker. Broker's going to, you know, turn them into collections or whatever, you know, mean and nasty, ugly things happen. <clears throat> so back to the spy, what Scott is saying is there's a better way. So one of the things we could do is come over to SDS. This is a leveraged inverse ETF. Let's break that down. Leveraged. I believe SDS is 2x, meaning for every percent that the uh, S&P goes down, SDS goes up. So yeah, we're at 6% right now. The S&P 500 is down 3%, right? So we're up 6% on SDS. 2x, and then inverse means it's going the opposite. So you can see, obviously, this has been going up. As you know, the overall market's been selling off. So you could just buy these shares, buy these shares at $53. And your worst case scenario is that it goes to zero. And I don't even know if it's possible that it goes to zero. I, I actually don't know if it's possible that it goes to zero because the market would have to go to infinity. So I don't even know how that works. But, you know, metaphorically speaking, your, your, your total risk on the table is $53 per share. So that's why Scott's saying, A, leveraged ETFs, not leveraged, inverse ETFs for sure. And there's all kinds of these. You guys can Google inverse ETF S&P 500. Um, usually Investopedia has good ones. I don't know what optimized portfolio is. Looks like I've clicked on it before. The three best inverse ETFs, SDS, SPXU. I've not heard of SH, but ProShares is very reputable. Mm -hmm. What you want to make sure of is a couple things. Number one, that they've got good volume. And number two, that their fees are low. And you can look up their fees. Expense ratio of 0.89. Um, I think any of these are good SDS for sure. 0.9. And that's basically saying they're taking a cut to manage this ETF. It's going to have a decay 
of that. And I, I think that's actually an annualized percentage. So take that 1% and divide it by however many days, trading days of the year there are, and that's the actual cost per day. So it's, you don't really notice the fee per day. These are not long-term investment vehicles. So don't like, if you think the market's going down for two years and you just want to write it down, I don't know that I would buy, you know, and, and keep an inverse ETF for that long. But in addition to this, there's other ETFs that you can trade too. So like, you know, if you're bearish on um, American Airlines, what's American Airlines ticker? Is it AAL? What is AAL? That's it. I was thinking AA, but that didn't make sense. So if we're bearish on American Airlines because gas is going to put them out of business, which by the way, we probably should have been bearish on American Airlines. That would have been a really smart thing to do. Um, you could trade American Airlines or you could trade ticker symbol Jets. We actually did this trade two months ago, probably. Um, I think it was actually right here. It was right before the Russian invasion. And um, we took that bearish trade. It was pretty cool. So Jets. Is comprised of. Yahoo Finance does a pretty good job. It's like the one good thing they do. Uh, let's do this differently. Jets. Uh, what are those called? Components? There's a there's a technical name for it. Um, Jets ETF holdings. That's what it is. Back to Yahoo Finance. So this is top 10 holdings. There's a place to find all the holdings. But point being is, this is what I want you to see. When you're trading jets, you're simultaneously trading Delta Airlines, United Airlines, Southwest Airlines. You can see by percent what they represent here. American Airlines, Alaska, Sun Country, whatever that is, Allegiant, JetBlue, SkyWest, Air Canada. And there's probably some more here as well. So, you know, if we wake up in the morning and find out that um, American Airlines is insolvent and they drop, yeah, it's going to pull Jets ETF down with it, but it's only going to impact it 10% or 9.5% proportionally. So that's what Scott's, what Scott's saying, that you can temper some of these um some of these volatile moves by trading an ETF. There's also sector ETFs. Like if you wanted to trade the financial sector, XLF is the financial sector ETF. And this is, then you could come up here, XLF. Click on holdings. This is Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, et cetera. So Berkshire Hathaway representing 12, almost 13%, JP Morgan representing 11%. So you can trade the financial sector as a whole. There's one other thing I was going to say, and I'm blanking on it now. Short selling, ETFs, reducing risk. What was I going to say, Scott? I know you were reading my mind. It's the safety aspect of it, maybe something like that versus... Don't remember. Hmm. Anyway, maybe it'll come back to me. <clears throat> Chris, what are your thoughts? Um, I think for active traders, I'm not a big fan of ETFs, but for people that maybe are not trading the markets regularly um, and they're just trying to stash money away, I think they're fine. Tell me more. <laughs> what would you what would you advocate for as a as a very active trader? Um, figure out the stocks in the ETFs that are most likely to go up and down. Can I share my screen? Oh yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So if we look at a day like today, for example, um, you know, does buying the information technology sector stop you from losing money today? No. You know, I mean, sure, you might lose less on the overall tech sector than you do on some of these specific names that are down, you know, 8% today, because um, you average it in with ones that are only down 3% today. But it's not like it's just a cure all that, you know, buy ETFs and you're fine, <laughs> right? So mm -hmm. um, I think if you're an 
if you're not an active trader and you know you have areas of the market you want to be invested in, you can't be bothered to do the research and find individual charts, individual companies that you like or don't like, then sure, fine, whatever, just buy the whole sector. But if you're an active trader, I think it's lazy to just trade the ETF because you can't be bothered to do any research to trade the individual stocks. Like if I'm short on tech, rather than just shorting XLK, like I would rather come in here and figure out, okay, well, which of these companies are likely to drop the most relative to the others, right? And I can hedge mm. that by like being short Qualcomm and being long Microsoft, right? Because if these both drop on a one-day basis, right? Qualcomm's down 7%, Microsoft's down 3%. Okay, well then overall that trade is up 4%, right? I make money on that trade, but I'm still hedging out sector risk by doing that. So I think that's very if smart. You are an active trader. I think just trading the ETF is lazy unless you have a specific reason why you're trying to trade the entire basket instead of like laser focusing on the exact charts you want to trade. But I think for people that are not actively trading, then they're fine. And especially, I mean, there's other times that ETFs are super useful. Um, for example, you know, you were talking about using inverse ETFs, that's fine. Um, for example, like if you want to trade the index, right? Well, I mean, you can buy SPX options. They're ridiculously expensive, but that's about it, right? You can buy futures, but you can't buy shares of the index, right? So if you want mm -hmm. to do that, sure, you have to trade the ETF. So I think there are good uses for ETFs. Um, like inverse ETFs and that sort of thing. But if you're just using them as a proxy for trades because you can't be bothered to do the work, that's where I'm not a big fan of ETFs. I don't like using them as a crutch. And you're just going to get average returns doing that anyways, right? Like I'm not going to get an 8% gain shorting uh, XLK here like I could get if I was shorting now specifically, right? So... Mm -hmm. That's my That's take good. on ETFs. If you're an active trader, I'd rather you just do the work and figure out which stocks you like best. That's really good. Um, I'm not gonna say what I thought. I'm gonna self filter. I was about to. I was about to create some controversy, but we're gonna filter. <laughs> um. I think, I think that's really wise. And I don't want this to go by unnoticed or quickly. Did you catch what Chris said where you could go long or go short Qualcomm and go long Microsoft? That's a way to hedge sector risk, but still net today, today's numbers, specifically um, the 4% spread, you'd still be up 4%, which is very interesting. That spreads trading, not to be confused with option spreads trading. And that's one of the things Chris first taught me when, when we met. I was like, that is a very smart way to approach this. There's all kinds of ways that you can hedge. Chris teaches an entire class called Hedged. If you guys haven't taken it, you 100% should. It'll change your life. Right. So what Josh is talking about there is pairs trading, right? Where if I think that there's money to be made by shorting some technology companies, which there definitely is right now, well, I'm going to look inside the technology ETF here, I'm going to see, you know, what are the weakest looking charts or the weakest looking companies, if you're doing it from a fundamental standpoint, and what are the strongest ones? And, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that a company like, let's say Oracle here, that's down 2% today, doesn't mean that it necessarily has a strong chart from an absolute standpoint, but it could be stronger than Qualcomm's chart, right? Or stronger than Now's chart. So there's relative strength and weakness within a sector or an industry. So all I'm talking about there is, you know, finding the charts that look better in a sector and buying those, finding the charts that look weaker in a sector and shorting those. And then you have a pairs trade on where even if the whole sector goes up and down, well, if everything goes up, my long's going to make money and my short is going to lose money. If everything goes down, my short makes money and my long loses money, right? But you can see they don't move the same amount, right? So if I have a stronger chart, like let's say Oracle here, Microsoft, these are down, let's say Oracle is down 2%, right? So if I bought Oracle, but I was short Qualcomm, well, I would make 7% on Qualcomm, but I would lose 2% on Oracle. But overall, that means I'm up 5%, right? And I've still hedged out that sector risk. So that's why I like doing that. Um, so if I, you know, if I'm bearish on um, tech here, I'm not just going to buy the tech ETF because if I'm wrong and tech goes up, well, then I just lose money. Right. And I don't like that. Uh, I don't like the odds of that. Right. So I would rather find two stocks within the sector, find one that looks super weak, go short that one, find one that looks relatively strong, 
go long that one, and then I can make money on the difference, the relative performance between the two, rather than an absolute, do they just go up or down? So that's how I like to structure things. I uh, will say, I was curious about Qualcomm when we were talking about it, and that looks like a pretty interesting chart to be watched. My opinion is it's telling us that it's got more, more gas in the tank here, bearish. That's a, that's a textbook quad to almost five multiple top. I mean, look at that consolidation up there and then just ripping through support. There's maybe a little semblance of support or support zone remaining, but um, that's, that seems definitive to me. It's telling us what it wants to do. I'm not saying it won't have a little pullback, but you can notate on your chart if you want. Chris, you're still sharing your screen. Chris, do you see Sorty's comment? I do not. Sorry, I'm not. I don't have Zoom up. Said I've shorted the tech sector and gone long on consumer staples. Is trying to use the non-correlated sectors. Is this applying your technique properly? Sure. So that's another way to do it is to trade the individual sectors. I don't like it as much as trading individual stocks, but it is definitely one way to do pairs trading. And today, I mean, that, that trade's doing great, right? Consumer staples are down today, but they're not down as much as tech is. So overall, you're making money on that trade. I remember what I was going to say about short selling now. Um, well, Chris is marking this chart up, or if he wants to mark it up anymore. Um, when you short a stock and dividends roll around, you're also on the hook to pay those dividends in. And a lot of people don't realize that. But you don't get the dividend. You end up paying the dividend back. So um, keep that in mind, too. I'm not anti-short selling at all from a moral perspective. And I'm not even, I short all the time, but I'll do it more on shorter time frames. I would either trade a put option if your account risk can handle it or look for an inverse uh, version of that stock. Um, we're kind of rounding the corner here, going into the top of the hour. We can start wrapping things up. But for those that are here live still, I put in the chat a little bit earlier. We got pretty good attendance right now. What do we got? That's amazing. Look at you guys. So many things on the screen here. Seven people here live, 33 total. Um, immediately following this live stream, Scott's going to be jumping in and doing a Q&A for the Traction uh, cohort that's coming in to his uh, elite mastermind. If you guys have questions about what that looks like, uh, if it's a right fit for you, then I encourage you to do that. The link is in the chat in YouTube. I'll also put it in the chat here in... Um, Zoom. If you need a password, it's traction, lowercase. I don't think you'll need a password to get in. If you're interested as well in the all new Traction Pro, which may be one and done, or at least in its format that we're going to do it this quarter based on some uh, restrictions that are being placed on Scott with the funds that are licensing these systems. Um, if you're interested in Traction Pro, you can also go to the Q&A or Scott can hop on a phone call with you as well if that's um, something you'd like to discuss with him more privately. I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I don't think we've got enough time to open a new topic unless you wanted to do any follow-up on Qualcomm, Chris. Not off the top of my head. All right. I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping this up here. I appreciate you guys. I want to leave us with this thought, and then I'm going to send it to Chris. I'll send it to Scott. We'll give Chris the last word today. Um, we've talked all week in the recession-proof training about how recessions, and to some extent, bear markets, are a natural redistribution of wealth. And don't, don't hear something I didn't say there. I'm not advocating for redistributing wealth. That's a whole political, philosophical commentary. What is actually happening in this recession is there's a whole bunch of cash that has been just upset and thrown into the air, and it's available for the grabs. Example, 2008, when Uber launched, there was a bunch of cash that went up in the air, right? It was taken from the, the taxi industry. And it was made available to all of us to grab whoever wanted to go start driving their car around, taking people to dinner and back home. 
that's what I mean when I say there's a redistribution of wealth. It went from taxi drivers to ordinary Joes with cars. Same thing happened in the Airbnb industry. Cash got sucked out of the hotel and resort industry, and it started going in the pockets of consumers as they put their house or even their couch on Airbnb for rent. It's an apple basket, apple cart upset, whatever that saying is. And so I don't want you to be looking at this economic data that's coming out with fearful eyes. I want you to look at it with optimistic eyes and realize recession equals reset. Recession equals reset. Cash is about to get jettisoned up into the air. And the question is, how much of it are you going to put in your genes? And are you prepared to do so? Are you prepared to take advantage of those opportunities? I am making massive changes in my investments and uh, resources that I have that generate cash flow for our family. I'm making massive investments in myself, joining masterminds myself, putting myself around like-minded individuals, many of them that are way smarter than me, so that together we can see these opportunities and put cash in our genes. And so if you're on the fence about traction or on the fence about taking some training at TSU or wherever, I mean, it doesn't have to be trade smart. We would love it if it be us. I recommend, I encourage you to consider that now might be the right time to do that. So as this redistribution of wealth occurs, you can grab some of that cash and put yourself a little further in the financial line than you are right now. So that's my heart. That's it. the end is not here. The opportunity is here. I encourage you guys to snag it. Scott, we'll go to you. Chris, we'll wrap up with you. And then we'll see everybody here next week. Hey guys, thank y'all. Appreciate y'all being here today. Enjoyed it. And I will see those of you going to the, um, this next Q and a session with me here in a minute, just a little bit. Y'all have a great weekend ahead. Bye. I'll try to make this fast, but this is something that Scott and I touched on um, last week when Josh wasn't here was that there's basically four approaches that you can take to, uh, to this kind of like four levels, at least is how I think about it on um, approaching this environment that we're in. Level zero is what I just call deer in the headlights, right? You're just watching your 401k go up in smoke and you're not having a good time. And that's the worst situation to be in. So I encourage anyone that's there right now, do something. And the first thing you can do is what I think of as level one, which would be move to cash, right? You can just be flat. Josh and I both did this during the COVID crash, right? When we don't know what's going on, we're not sure what's going to happen. We don't have a game plan for it. And the whole world just went upside down. We're not really sure what to do with that. Non-participation is always an option, right? You can always just say, all right, I'm not comfortable with what's going on right now. I'm just not going to risk anything. And that's fine, right? So you go to cash, you take your risk off the table. That's always an option but you don't triple your account doing that like Stephen Padway does. So yeah. some of the other things you can do, I'd say level two, the next thing you can do is trade hedged, right? So right now, no matter what other trades I'm taking in my portfolio, I'm doing some unusual options activity stuff. I had some squeezes. There's basically nothing that's currently squeezing because everything has been squeezed at this point. Um, but through all of that, I still have spy puts, right? I've got a hedge on right now. You could trade QQQ puts, whatever, whatever you're into. Um, but something that is going to protect you when everything is going down, right? You can still take your individual trades, but have some protection. And then I would say kind of the, the third level or the most advanced part of this would be just aggressively trading into the decline, right? So where you don't even have just a blanket hedge like spy puts or something like that, but you're doing more the, the Scott Landers thing where you're just taking advantage with the trades as they come and you're, you're trading with the trend, just realizing that you know, bearish trends are not like bullish trends and all of the other differences that we've been talking about in recession proof this week and all of that. So that's kind of how it gets divided in my mind, at least is, you know, there's doing nothing. There's at least being flat. There's having a blanket hedge. And then there's more leaning into, um, you know, trading the downside. And I think what we're really trying to do is get people through those levels, right? If you are just staring there doing nothing, we want to at least get you to do something. Even if that's just going to cash, that's better than standing there and watching you lose money. Better than that, I would rather you guys head your portfolio, still trade through it, but have some sort of protection in the background. And then even better than that is if you get to you know, the, the stock landers level, and then you can just be yeah. aggressively trading into it. So that's kind of where I want to wrap things up today. 
give you guys stuff to stuff to work on stuff to look forward to and uh yeah if you haven't already liked the video on youtube subscribe to our channel we do this every thursday so we'll see you guys next week as well thank you for joining us and